Um, I'm Mark Cullen. I'm the uh, director of our Center for Population Health Sciences. And on behalf of the center, um, it is our, my great pleasure to uh, welcome you. Um, the center has many, many activities, which I won't bore you with, but among the most exciting and uh, most heavily subscribed of the research areas that have been the focus over the last couple of years has been the area of sex and gender. And it's a particular thrill to be able, at this relatively early stage in our development, to be able to co-host uh, with our colleagues at Wisdom this, uh, this uh, rather exciting um, seminar. It did fall to me, I guess uh, I guess this is the problem when you're the co-host, uh, to uh, do a little bit of housekeeping, and we'll probably have to repeat this since uh, not enough of you are fully here yet. Um, we are going to try, as best we can, to keep to a fairly uh, strict schedule. It's our experience. These things work better when we, uh, when we do. Um, we will be breaking for lunch quite early, and this is just the peculiarity of the way our guests uh, needed things time. So we're going to be breaking around 11.20 for lunch. Um, there, uh, obviously, there'll be, there will be lunch. Many of you may, especially if you're unfamiliar with our fabulous campus, and if maybe the sun comes out, you may want to wander around. It's quite nice uh, around here, but we will expect all of you back here at, at uh, 20 after, uh, 20 after uh, 12 uh, so that we can get going with the, um, with the afternoon events. We are allowing some time. Hopefully, uh, uh, our speakers will be, um, will be uh, sufficiently brief to leave a little time for questioning after each of the sessions. I think they're all going to be pretty provocative, but we do encourage you because we're recording the session to use the microphones that we will have set up at the, um, towards the end of each of the, um, of the talks. And for those of you unfamiliar with, uh, with uh, CEPR, one of our sister centers, uh, the, um, the bathrooms are just off to your left when you head outside. And uh, there's also plenty of quiet space if people need uh, whatever to make a call or something. Anyway, uh, I will look forward to speaking with you more. And I'm Marcia Stefanik. I'm the director of the Wisdom Center, which is Women and Sex Differences in Medicine. And uh, we are, Londa Schiebinger and I are co-chairs of the working group of the Population Health Sciences for Sex and Gender in Health. And so this is why we're doing this together. Uh, but it, I do want you to know a little bit about what Wisdom does. So we are in the medical school. We're actually funded by every department in the School of Medicine and the Dean's Office uh, to do seed grants. We just did our uh, next round of C grants. So we have uh, about 25 projects now underway of people who are looking at sex and gender issues in medicine. Um, we uh, do uh, women annual women's health forums every year. We're going to be doing that uh, in partnership with the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology with Leslie Subak, who is the new uh, chair of OBGYN. So that's going to be a May event, and we'll tell you about that. And then we also have a winter uh, annual winter symposium on basic and translational research on sex differences uh, that uh, we are working right now with the genetics department trying to get a genetics conference. In the past, we've had one in neuroscience. Actually, we've had two in neuroscience now. We've had one in cardiovascular medicine, one in cancer, and one in immunology. So we're really trying to get the Stanford campus to become fully aware of what's going on with sex differences. So it's my great pleasure to uh, co-host this event, Gender Matters, Why Sex and Science is Not Enough. And you're going to get to hear uh, six very different presentations, uh, angles from this, this topic. Uh, and we're, gonna, we're really lucky to have today the director of the Office of Research and Women's Health at the NIH, uh, Janine Austin Clayton, uh, who is Associate Director for Research on Women's Health as I mentioned, director of the, the Office of Research on Women's Health at the NIH. Uh, in 2012, uh, Dr. Clayton strengthened the, the research, um, strengthened the NIH support to actually do this kind of research so that we could be looking at diseases, disorders, and conditions that affect women. And in doing that, we really have to be looking at sex differences because so much of our science is male-based. And so if we're going to really understand women or females, and in my opinion, basic biology, uh, we really need to do this work. Uh, she was the architect of the NIH policy uh, to, uh, to, to scientists to consider sex as a biological variable across the research spectrum. Uh, 
Uh, so this is, she's done a, a huge effort to get the NIH to enhance the reproducibility, the rigor, and the transparency of this work. And as co-chair of the NIH Working Group on Women in the Biomedical Career in Women's Health, she's played a huge effort, uh, leads a huge effort in getting women's uh, careers advanced in, in this area. So we're really lucky to have Dr. Clayton here. Uh, she flew in late last night, and she's got to be leaving actually even before we finish the whole symposium. So we are lucky to just squeeze her in at that time, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Clayton. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. First, I want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Schiebinger and Dr. Marcia Stefanik, for inviting me. And it really is your hard work that got me here. Um, it, the incredible record of that work is, is not something that should be minimized. And it's a real reason why some of this has advanced. So thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. The title of my talk is The Power, Potential, and Promise of Considering Sex as a Biological Variable, which I will abbreviate as SABV during my presentation. And as you heard, the talks are going to be from all different perspectives today, so I'm thrilled to be able to head us off. I also want to acknowledge the other Stanford colleagues, and I understand there's a change in the schedule there, but I wanted to acknowledge Stanford University for paying attention to these issues and for uh, supporting this Wisdom Center and other efforts here. I begin all of my talks by recognizing those that came before. I think legacy and history are critically important. On your far left, you're going to see Dr. Ruth Kirstein, the first woman director of an institute at NIH. She was the in director of the NIGMS, Institute for General Medical Sciences. In the middle, you see Senator Barbara Mikulski from the great state of Maryland, the longest serving woman in the Senate. She recently retired. Dr. Bernadine Healy, the first and so far only woman director of the National Institutes of Health. And of course, Dr. Vivian Pinn, the first full-time director of ORWH, and she was the director there for 20 years. I was privileged to be her deputy and then uh, to be asked uh, to be able to continue. And so our mission at ORWH is threefold, to expand women's health research, and we'll talk a little bit about how we're conceiving that, uh, to include and work to promote the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical research, and to promote career advancement for women in STEM. But since I was first up, I thought I'd mention a little bit about these terms sex and gender. And I think many of us in this room have had experiences where they've been confused or conflated. But again, uh, Simone de Beauvoir first articulated what is now termed the sex and gender distinction when she said, quote, one is not born a woman, one becomes one. And it's that distinction that began in 1949 with her. In fact, when you're born, the first question that is asked about you is, is it a boy or a girl, right? Other than all of us having mothers, that's pretty much all of what we all have in common, right? And what makes a female a female or a male a male is sex, and I know this audience uh, is aware of this, but I'll just, since I'm the first speaker, I'd cover that. And what makes a woman a woman or a man a man is sex and gender, and certainly uh, we have our social science colleagues here who will expand upon this and talk about this later. But again, uh, just to talk about the fact that gender is a social construct, and, and that's critically important for our well-being and our health. So a little bit of history with uh, lots of things left off of the slide, but just a few things here I want to acknowledge. So Simone de Beauvoir, The Second Sex, was published in 1949. Rhoda Unger initiated the current usage of the term gender and how we conceptualize it uh, 30 years later. The Office of Research on Women's Health was formed in 1990. The Institute for Gender and for sex and gender at the Canadian Institutes for Health Research was formed in 2000. And the landmark IOM report was just released in 2001. The Organization for the Study of Sex Differences, or OSSD, 2006, and then Gendered Innovations was born in 2009. The first gender summit was not until 2011. And then the European Union has set policy, incredibly far-reaching policy, in fact, for 137 fields back in 2013. Back to NIH, we released a new policy related to rigor and reproducibility in 2015. Uh, that included sex as a biological variable, but that policy went into effect in January of 2016. So a little outline for my comments today, the power, potential, and promise of considering sex as a biological variable. First, the power 
I think we're able to see things that we can't see if we don't have this in mind. I call that detecting data hiding in plain sight. Uh, the potential to spark new avenues of inquiry and really to understand basic mechanisms and to unravel those, uh, that, that, those mysteries about sex differences. And I like to also say sex influences on health and disease. It's not always a sex difference. So the promise, of course, is to better understand how both men and women, males and females, uh, are similar and different. Uh, and in the end, because our mission is to just turn discovery into health, to enable clinicians to provide better treatment and to deliver their health care with care. So first with power, you know, what do you see on this slide? You guys gonna wake up? You've had coffee, I've had two cups. Donut, I heard donut. Okay, most people see the donut, a small proportion see the hole. In fact, companies have made the donut holes, right? Just think about that, that's a whole new product. Well, I use this for an analogy of what data are hiding in plain sight that you're not looking at, that are there, and what could you learn to see that you don't normally look at? And where are the gaps in our research portfolio? So this slide is about what we know we don't know versus what we don't know we don't know, right? So now we know we don't know a lot of things. So we're not uh, yet in the know. Okay, so the power of disaggregated data. So you might have a situation like this, where uh, a control group and a treated group, this is just generic, uh, no error bars or anything, and there's some sort of disease, disease impact you're measuring, the males and the females are, are combined in both the treatment and the control group, and it doesn't look like that is very promising as a potential treatment, right? But what if I told you that exact data could result from this data, where males clearly had a reduction in disease impact with that treatment in the red bar, and females clearly had an increase in disease impact with that treatment? You might say, Dr. Clayton, that is a rather extreme example. I don't think that really happens. That's real data, and this is Louise McCullough's work. This is in vitro work uh, related to a stroke model, an uh, ischemic model. And in fact, this PARP1 inhibitor, um, and these are mice, reduced the percent of total uh, infarct in male mice and increased the ischemic damage seen in female treated mice because PARP1 is not involved in the cell death pathway for this ischemic cell death for female these female mice. So PARP1 being a target for a treatment would cause a problem for female mice. Whether it causes a problem for female humans is a different question, but I'm just showing you, by, just by disaggregating the da data, there's information that's available that we're not seeing. So in 2015, I mentioned the guide notice that NIH released, and it was an entitled in Enhancing Reproducibility Through Rigor and Transparency. And here we were clarifying and revising our application instructions to enhance the reproducibility of research findings. I think everyone here is aware of multiple publications citing the fact that studies cannot be reproduced, and that certainly causes a problem for, for science, and in my opinion, for society as well. Among the four aspects that were included in this rigor and reproducibility initiative were, first, the scientific premise of the proposed research, Second, the rig rigorous experimental design, uh, basic principles there. And then third, consideration of sex and other relevant biological variables. All three of those are scored as components within the research application. At the same time, we uh, subsequently released the actual guide notice that announced the sex as a biological variable policy um, and announced the effective date of January 25th, 2016, back in 2015. In a nutshell, the policy says that NIH expects that sex as a biological variable will be factored into the research designs, analyses, and reporting in vertebrate animal and human studies. That's the policy in a nutshell. There are a variety of resources on our website that I'll refer you to for more information. But just as a quick aside, why do we need this policy? Why did we have to do this policy? Um, why didn't the biomedical research enterprise move forward with understanding that sex has such profound effects in a molecular, cellular, 
and subcellular level that we should account for it appropriately. Unfortunately, we had an over-reliance on male animals and cells for a variety of reasons. Uh, we also had a situation where there was a lack of attention to the effect of sex, the influence of sex. And there was a lack of transparency when people published their results. They wouldn't publish whether they were male or female mice. They wouldn't publish whether they were cells derived from a male or a female um, organism for their publications. And unfortunately, that still continues. And inconsistent reporting of sex-specific findings in publications, even clinical trial publications. So I, we looked at um, NIH-funded phase three clinical trials, big clinical trials that were designed such that a valid analysis could be performed for sex differences, and fewer than a third of the seminal publications from NIH-funded phase three clinical trials had any sex-specific results reported in any of their papers. And I would argue that everyone in this room might be taking a medication or have a condition that was studied in those phase three clinical trials. So as a result of that situation, we have an incomplete knowledge base about male and female biology. Uh, we risk drawing erroneous conclusions. We certainly are not maximizing our return on investment as a research enterprise. We have irreproducible results and we can't explain those. Um, I call these toxicity surprises when we find out that a drug that is now taken by millions of people has adverse effects in men or women and is now withdrawn from the market. And importantly, we have a situation where we have erosion of public trust that science is the way to solve society's problem. And indeed, Roth and Cox said that science isn't science if it isn't reasonable. So what are these requirements? They're about providing transparency, enhancing rigor, filling gaps in knowledge. Sure. Um, but they're not about requiring specific methods. Is this better? Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. They're not about requiring specific methods. They, are not, they do not require studies to be empowered to detect sex differences. They do not require the doubling or quadrupling of the sample size. So again, in terms of consequences of inattention to sex-specific effects, I'll cite this GAO report, General Accountability Office report, that identified drugs withdrawn from the market, and eight of those 10 10 drugs withdrawn from this certain time period pose greater risk for women than for men. The top are prescription drugs, drugs with evidence of greater health risks in women, and those are the eight. Four of them had specific adverse effects only in women, and the other four had more adverse effects in women because more women were taking these medications. Okay? So two of them were an appetite suppressant, so you could understand that and they increase the risk for valvular heart disease. The third was terfenidine or seldane, an antihistamine that increases the risk for a potential fatal arrhythmia called torsade de point. I took this antihistamine for every day for about five years when I was a resident. Propulsid was another. It's a gastrointestinal drug. One of my Sjogren's syndrome patients took this medication. So clearly there's an issue there. And what about the potential? And we're moving from the power to the potential to see with greater clarity. Um, I'm an ophthalmologist by training. I was at the Eye Institute for many years. In fact, still see patients on Tuesday mornings. Probably one of the most fun things I get to do. That's what my vision looks like on the left when I don't have my contacts in. I'm very myopic, and when I put my contacts in and my glasses in, things are very crisp and clear. And we have the ability, by putting on the sex and gender lens, to see things more clearly. And this last key is the, uh, the Snellen chart, and I want to share with you, as you're now thinking, she's an ophthalmologist, she's doing women's health, that's a very unusual situation, so I'll tell you why I'm doing women's health. I, I was reading a meta-analysis that uh, was published and court right in Llewellyn, and it cited this t disturbing piece of data that two-thirds of the people that are blind are visually impaired in the world are women. Two thirds. And I didn't learn that in medical school, and I didn't learn that in ophthalmology residency. I didn't learn that in fellowship. And in the United States, it's the same. It's not a developing country issue, and we don't know why. The fact that we did not know why, and the fact that I didn't get trained on that was so disturbing to me. I was already studying Sjogren's syndrome or premature ovarian insufficiency and interested in sex hormones, but that is really what made me say, this whole issue is something that needs more attention. 
And we're aware that there's sex differences in immunity that result in disease bias. We're aware that autoimmune diseases affect more women than men. In fact, Sjogren's syndrome, which I was studying, nine times as many uh, women are affected as men. So that's a pretty significant uh, disease bias there. And on the other end, um, men are more affected by these non-reproductive cancers that are significant as well. But look in the middle in terms of infectious diseases. You can see that we know there are immune system differences between men and women. Just generically, it's very complicated, but women tend to mount a much more immune, a vigorous immune resp response to vaccinations, for example, than do men. Um, here you can see that Ebola is on the male side for a little bit of a male bias in terms of pathogen clearance. But if you look at the gender piece of that, there were more women affected by Ebola because women were the people cleaning the bodies. And that's how they got infected. So that's the gendered piece. But men had this issue with delayed pathogen clearance and so had some poorer outcomes from Ebola. So we also need to look at what we see in terms of, of recognizing uh, cycles. And, and here I'm going to highlight what are so-called normal laboratory values in men and women. We measure these all the time in our Chem 20, but I don't know if you're aware that there are actually statistically significant menstrual cycle-related changes in these major analytes uh, in these tests. So for example, C-reactive protein and parathyroid hormone are higher during the early follicular phase. Insulin and your white blood cell count are higher during the luteal phase. So that's something we need to know. What are the normals for men and women? And for women, did you look at age and cycle as part of your normative values? We also need to use all the tools that we have at our disposal to see analytically and to examine differences between sex chromosome effects and sex hormone effects. Uh, and Art Arnold and others developed the transgenic mouse model called the four-core genotype, uh, where he is able to dissociate those findings by taking SRY off the Y chromosome and putting on an autosome. Therefore, you can look at sex chromosomal effects separately from uh, sex hormone effects. So I would argue that we need to look at this holistically. And I know I spelled that wrong, so I put it in quotes because I think of it as the whole person or the whole system. And we know at a cellular level, male sex matters, and there, every, sex, sex, every cell has a sex. We know at a system level, I mentioned a few immune system differences. And we know at an organism level, sex affects disease manifestation and response to treatments, and also uh, adverse effects related to medications. But all of these effects interact with each other simultaneously. So the promise of studying sex and gender, which is the whole point of our meeting today, is to be able to see a bigger part of the picture. I'm saying it's seeing the whole picture because that's the way that I'm looking at it. We recognize there are many, many other factors. But I would say that sex, remember the first thing that's asked about you is whether you're a boy or a girl, is a fundamental biological variable. And something has to come first. And that because it is so fundamental, it should be considered first. So these folks are all, uh, this is the proverbial elephant, and everyone is touching different parts of the elephant, and they say it's a spear, it's a wall, it's a fan, and if, if we put that all together, that's what you get, right? But really, that's not what it is. It's an elephant that has a life course, it's a mother and a baby, and we're not actually even seeing the whole picture or even understanding the whole picture by the way we're operating. And so in our basic research world, I'm going to talk about how you might account for sex as a biological variable from the entire basic through clinical translational uh, population-based research continuum. So I'm starting with basic. And there's this notion that there's basic, basic research. I think we, we use that term at NIH. I don't know. Basic, basic is very, very basic. Like, I just want to understand what happens. Why does this protein fold? What is this? So you're, you have no hypothesis. It's blue sky exploratory work. So we don't know very much at all about how sex may be playing a role in anything in that realm. So what we say at the cellular and subcellular level is you should observe and report sex-based data. Be transparent. You're using male mice. You're using male cells. You're using whatever. Just say what you're using and say what you found. 
And then basic research with cells, tissues, and animals, again, observe and report sex-based data. So it's a highly, it's a lot about transparency here. And of course, we would expect that you recognize because sex might have an effect that you would include male and female animals. Certain proteins, in fact, come in a female and male version that differ by several amino acids. That really could be significant in your work. And if you weren't aware of that, you really it could make it very difficult to interpret your data. Uh, and according to David Page, he uses the phrase that males and females read their genomes differently due to Y chromosome linked genes. Um, did you know that phenol red can, can uh, exert ex estrogenic effects in culture media? So if you're using female cells or male cells, that might disrupt the assay that you're performing. And so here, really, we want to just um, have you report the sex of the cells and tissues for transparency purposes as part of reproducibility, but also recognize that cells from different sexes like neurons, I mentioned Louise McCullough's work, may have different responses to cytotoxic perturbations like nitrosative stress and excitotoxicity. So you need to be aware of that. Are you mixing the cells together in the dish or not, and why? We're not saying that that information can apply any sex-based effect on a larger biological unit, just uh, at the cell tissue or organ level, but we are saying that it's important to rigorous approach to research. Do you know the sex of your cells? And I'm citing Shah's work here, why knowing the sex of your cells is important. So sex chromosomes account for 5% of the total genome, of course, and uh, there are much, many more genes on the X chromosome than the Y chromosome, of course, but there, therefore it's a mathematical possibility that one in 20 of those proteins might differ, and I mentioned several already. And given those odds, we shouldn't be surprised that there are differences at a biochemical level or physiologic level at the cellular level. So I talked about basic, and now I'm moving into turning discovery into health, and this is the category called preclinical research. So it's called preclinical research because it's preclinical. You're moving to the clinic or you're modeling a human disease that affects men and women. If you're modeling a human disease that affects men and women, your model needs to include male and female animals in it. And as you move in that space, we're asking you that you consider sex as a biological variable, okay? How you might do that? You could include comparable numbers of males and females. You could employ a factorial design. You could employ sex stratified randomization. You could disaggregate your data by sex. You could report your results by sex. You could interpret your data in the context of sex. Those are some of the ways that you could account for SABV in the design of preclinical research. Now, when you're moving into translational research, you're going to first in human, you're trying to identify a target, you're testing a therapeutic agent, you want to go to the clinic. To me, that's a hard checkpoint where you need to study both sexes. And we know what study means, and it's not include, right? right? I told you that phase three clinical trials for NIH, there are women in the studies. The results are not included in the publication, so we have to move beyond inclusion. Inclusion is not, it's just a starting point. So when you want to study something, you act appropriately, you design it appropriately. And so you, here you need to consider both safety and efficacy for both sexes. So we're trying to say, does this treatment work in men or males? Does this treatment work in females? We're not saying, is there a sex difference in response to this treatment, because that's a different design. And that requires more numbers than examining effect in men or males and females separately. Uh, we know there are multiple examples of, of different pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. I'll give you a couple more examples later, and I want to make sure I keep on time here. So here's the turning discovery into health, moving to the end of the spectrum. So now we're in the clinical research space. You and I are signing an informed consent to be in a study. So we want you to study both sexes, and we want you to examine sex and gender differences, because now we're talking about people who are characterized by both sex and gender, and you're subjecting people to risk, right? So if you're going to subject someone to risk, don't we have an ethical responsibility to have done as much work as we can in advance of that translation to clinic to understand if there are 
clinically important male and female differences that might help us avoid having drugs with Dawn for the market because of liver failure, as happened with one of the diabetes drugs. So if you go move into the healthcare space, we want you to deliver sex and gender relevant treatments, right? So I have high blood pressure. I should be getting a therapeutic that is designed for me, not precision design, but with my background, my sex, you know, what is the appropriate first line antihypertensive? That's something that each and every one of us should expect our clinician to be able to provide to us. And we just don't have that information. And as a clinician, having a patient in front of me without that is it's not evidence-based medicine because you don't have the evidence upon which to base your clinical decisions. In the population health perspective, we want you to deploy sex and gender informed care policies and uh, practices, and that's the treatment context in the real world. We know that, for example, nicotine replacement therapies do not work as well in women as they do in men for smoking cessation, okay? So that's not your first line of therapy. You're not getting nicotine gum as your first line of therapy if you're a woman. So it changed your treatment decision. It doesn't say you don't use them, but it's not the first line of therapy, right? So in the clinical research, I mentioned several sex differences in immunity. I mentioned the flu vaccine. So you guys better have me to get a flu vaccine. I'm, my appointment's next Tuesday. I got my reminder from NIH that I can't see patients if I don't get it. Um, here's a public health issue. We always run out of the flu vaccine, right? You guys don't run out of it at Stanford? Okay. So there's a, there's a national issue. We make a batch of flu vaccine. We predict what the flu strain's going to be, and we often run out on a national level. Women actually, and you know there's this elderly flu vaccine, right, with the higher dose. Everybody knows about that, right? So we know that age is okay. We can give you a higher dosage because we know that you need it. Well, actually, women probably could have the same response, probably, I said, to half of the dosage of the flu vaccine because they mount a more vigorous immune response. What do you think about the public health impact of spreading that vaccine more widely because you understand that sex has an effect? It's not that the female vaccine is in a pink syringe. It's that your white blood cells respond differently to this vaccination. And I don't know if you're aware that uh, there's at least one, there's other drugs as well, but one drug that has a sex-specific dosage, and that's Zolpidem or Ambien. Uh, the FDA, and I applaud them for labeling that drug, the recommended dose for Ambien is 5 milligrams, it's 10 milligrams for men, because the women clear this drug more slowly than do men. It's a sleeping pill. So last night I couldn't sleep. I don't take sleeping pills, but say I couldn't sleep. I take the sleeping pill, I get up the next morning, you don't feel drowsy, because it's still in your system, but at a low level. So women don't feel drowsy, but they have a measurable delayed reaction time on driving simulation tests. So I don't want that person driving behind me. Do you? Public health impact. So I'll talk a little bit very briefly about sex and gender in clinical practice and SABV in the medical record. Do you know how sex and gender might affect each of these? So typically when we're rounding, we say this is a 43-year-old white female or something like that, right? So that's kind of how we talk about with whatever, with hyperkalemia. Um, we talk about a chief complaint and we talk about symptoms, right? So the chief complaint, the person says, I am having whatever, headaches every day with scintillating scotoma. I wonder what that might be, 30-year-old um, woman. So you're already doing your differential diagnosis for that, but you're also hearing the symptoms as to how a woman or a man might report their symptoms or might not report their symptoms, right? Which differ. That's a gendered issue. And if you are a man or a woman, you might respond to the man or the woman saying, I'm always tired, I can't get any sleep, I'm having hot flashes. You might respond to that differently if you're a man or a woman. So there's a gender dynamic issue there. History of present illness, medical and pregnancy history. We don't ask our 70-year-old woman Dr. Subek, we don't ask our seven-year-old woman, did you have preeclampsia? What, what geriatrician asks that? They don't. But those women are at increased risk for cardiovascular poor outcomes. So you're being a 
female in this case, and having been pregnant and having a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy is part of your vital sign, right? It's part of your history. And if you think about this in that way, this is not a sex and gender add-on. This is part of medicine. This is how we practice personalized medicine. Every single patient deserves that. In your physical exam and your vital signs, we talked about norms. Uh, and then your diagnostic test results. So I said, 35-year-old woman with scintillating scotoma and headache. Are there any medical students here? So what's that? You're smiling. Anybody know? Scintillating scotoma, headache, nausea. Migraine, okay, great. Much more common in women than men, right? So you already incorporated sex in your differential diagnosis. So you're doing it. It's not a separate thing. It's part of how you're operating. It actually is associated with an increased risk of stroke. Women who have visual aura and migraine have an increased risk of stroke. Therefore, when they become hypertensive, are you gonna be more or less aggressive with treating their hypertension? More, right? I hope. So that was me. That was when I was a resident, first year resident, on call by myself uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University. I thought I was having a stroke when I was there because I had numbness as well. But anyway, those are those issues. Sex and gender differences in prevention, management, and treatment of heart disease are well recognized. But I'm going to give you a few nu nuggets here to make sure that you have them. Um, unfortunately, women with myocardial infarction receive less guideline based diagnosis and less invasive treatment than do men. And we have guidelines. Women with AFib, the most common arrhythmia, receive less anticoagulation treatment with warfarin. Even so, they have a greater risk for stroke than do men. And this is the one that really is a little disturbing. Women are less likely to receive CPR from EMTs at the site of an emergency. And another study that was cited from Sweden, women were less likely to be prioritized in their triage after an accident than were men. So I talked about turning discovery into health and studying both sexes across the biomedical research continuum. And you can see that in this single view, which is from a FASA paper that I published called Studying Both Sexes, A Guiding Principle for Biomedicine. Reporting the results all along the way is certainly essential because if you're including males and females, but you're not reporting the results, what's the point? It's like you didn't do it, first of all. It's like you didn't do it, and you might be misinterpreting your data. So we talked about the fact that um, sex affects cells, system, and organism level. But what about the culture level, the, the, the environment in which the organism, in this case a person, is embedded? And assumptions about sex and gender affect research and clinical practice. And we under, need to understand them, both as researchers and as clinicians, when we take care of our patients. And so this is just a very basic um, slide to talk about the fact that, that sex is something that is established at the level of the individual, but gender incorporates both gender identity, gender dynamics, gender norms, institutional gender, and that's now we have a cultural context, we have a societal context, we have expectations that change over time, and they may be very fluid and change in terms of circumstances. You might be at work and behave one way, you might be at home, with your family and behave a different way. Uh, and so gender is much more complicated than is sex, and so far we don't have an easy way to measure that, but I'm, I'm sure that will be coming soon. So ORWH is starting to develop our new strategic plan for NIH, it's an NIH-Y strategic plan. I have this out on the front, um, the front table. I encourage you to respond to our request for information and let us know what you think we should be doing. I like to say, stay that I like to say that we study sex and gender influences in health and disease to inform and improve the health of women. That's the way we're conceiving of women's health across the life course. So obviously our health begins at preconception, in fact, generations before because of epigenetics, but we have this life course perspective that we really need to be taking into consideration. Then we have this, these internal factors, we talked about sex influences there, and that we can think of that as women's health in a 
biological perspective. And then we have these external factors that could be environment, they could be toxicants, they could be stressors, they could be family, they could be education, they could be health policies. So we think of that as women's health in context. And certainly all of these are interacting with each other and different things can interact at different points on the life course and have different effects. Uh, so it's a much more comprehensive view that includes both sex and gender. We know that sex or gender effects at one stage might not occur at other stages. We know that they might not show up unless you are stressed or something else happens to you, like you have an infection. Um, and we know, I mentioned preeclampsia already. Here's another example of a gendered health effect. So women and men um, here, these are women and men who are young, less than 55, who had an acute coronary event. And they measured personality characteristics that are traditionally from a Western perspective considered more associated with women's gender roles. Regardless of whether the patient was a man or a woman, people with more of those women's gender role traits had more recurrent acute coronary syndrome, were more likely to experience a major adverse cardiac event. So that's a gendered effect, not a sex effect. Um, clearly, we have a lot work to do in that space to help understand that. So we like to think about sex and gender, even though the, I like to look at through the sex and gender lens, we recognize there are many, many other factors that are important in health, including race, ethnicity, psychology exposures, the microbiome. I just read a paper this morning, a little piece this morning on um, the female mouse microbiome changing in response to stress, but the male mouse microbiome did not change and the microbiome that it changed to in the females was more of an obesogenic microbiome. It's interesting. Uh, geography, de demographics, all of these things affects health, so we know that. But we don't often think about how can I look at specific factors um, in terms of my research question, what are the factors that are most important? Is it, is it physiology, the microbiome? Is it sex and or gender? Sometimes hard to, to separate and perhaps not necessary to separate in every situation. Is it age? So we think that we need to think about this in a much more multifaceted way to acknowledge intersectionality, which of, of course was put forward initially around race, ethnicity, and other demographic variables, but you could expand the notion to think of all the things that might affect an individual's health so that we can develop more sophisticated techniques and ways to ask research questions that incorporate these perspectives. Because then we could get the answers that we actually need to treat our individual patients. We're not studying, we might be studying a population, but you're treating an individual patient. And we need that information. I've started to look at different languages and how they treat gender. Uh, so English and Chinese don't have gender as a component, like there's not, like there's not a female chair. It's not la chaise, it is a chair, right? But there are gendered languages. Um, French, German, Spanish, Italian are gendered. Hindi is gendered. Apparently Hebrew is gendered and it refers to the gender of the word. I don't speak um, Hebrew, so you guys tell me if I'm wrong on this. But some of these language even require modifiers. So you have el gato negro or la gata negra, whether it's a male or female. And in many gendered language languages, professions such as being a physician, the terms are masculine, right? Because they were historically practiced by men. So what might it be who's somebody who's not a native English speaker, who's translating from German in their mind, when it's me, are they gonna call me Dr. Man? Um, you know, it's, there's some potential for a cognitive dissonance there. In fact, in Germany, they've tried to use ways of language to make that distinction. So we use different words in different languages just to refer to men, women, boys, girls, older people, teenagers, all kinds of terms. But in Finnish and in Norwegian, in fact, there's only one word for sex and gender. So that's going to be a problem, Londa, for writing papers that translated into Finnish or Norwegian. It's not sex. It's not gender. It's sukopuoli. I don't know how to pronounce that. Anybody who's Finnish, please tell me. I'm going to end with, and I'm on time, right? Yes. And I'm going to end with something that every single person in this room needs to know about, and I think everyone is aware of the opioid crisis in the United States. First, look at California. 
It's different from the other states, so that's not unusual. Usually you guys do better, you're more health-minded. That's a very generic stereotype I'm putting out there. But let me just share the fact that the opioid crisis is a women's health issue. Higher rates of opioid-related inpatient hospital visits in 2014 is what you're seeing there. The, the states that are in blue had a higher rate of opioid-related inpatient hospital stays for men. Not surprising. That's how it's been. But all those purple states had higher rates for women. Did you know that? Right. I didn't know that. This is ARC data. Um, the white states we didn't have data for. But this clearly says something is going on with hospitalizations for women related to opioid use. Now, it's increasing for both women and men, right? And this is hospitalizations, not emergency room visits. So that might be telling us something. But clearly, that pattern means something. And it deserves attention, because maybe we need to be addressing the way we triage, the way we admit, the way we discharge from a gendered perspective. We certainly know there are sex differences in how the brain responds to opioids. We're not even going to talk about that. We're just talking about on a practical public health level why considering sex and gender is not an add-on. It is part of everything we should be doing that involves human beings because it's a critical and fundamental part of who we are. And by not attending to it in the way that we should, we have had missed opportunities to make a difference for men and for women so that in the future, we need to know what statistical innovations could help us explore these variables in the context of the myriad other factors that affect health and disease. What technical innovations, what device differences, what design differences we need to take into consideration, what sociological innovations and expansions of the notion of gender that our biomedical colleagues that we can incorporate from our social science colleagues so that we can better understand. They've been doing it much longer than we have, and certainly we want to learn from our colleagues so that we could better work together. And what methods, what models, what paradigms need to be put in place to help NIH and other funding organizations develop the next policy innovation, but importantly, to turn discovery into health for both men and women. So here's our info. Please do connect with us. There's a website. There's our, our Twitter handles and our Facebook page. Uh, please do take a look at our website. We have a variety of resources available there to help you think about SABV and how to factor that into research and designs and why both sex and gender matter for human health and disease. Thank you so much for your attention.